the Bible is full of God's commandments. That's a good thing because without them, we human beings, we, we wouldn't know accurately who he is, what he's like, what he loves and what he doesn't, what, what he requires of us if we want to be in right relationship with him. Our own understanding of that as people is twisted and, and marred, and we'd be confused and, and misled. So he's spoken and told us in his good commandments. And mostly when I say commandments, we, we often think of the Ten Commandments, but really that's just a, a ten-point header beneath which are all kinds of details. Many commands beneath the commandments, and each of them are important. God's Bible is full of his commands. We read them and we recognize them as good, and we try to put them together and understand them and, and see what, what's being required in them, and we want to follow them, and that's, that's good as far as that goes, but then inevitably we usually go too far. That's what gets us into trouble. People were never supposed to read and see the commandments as some sort of a straightforward recipe for a successful life. Like you take this, this recipe card and you, and you see what the ingredients are and, and in what order and to what degree you do them and, and how you combine and how long it takes and then poof, out the other side comes something that's perfect. The, the right and well-ordered and God-pleasing and successful and blessed life. Nope, that's not supposed to work. That's a misunderstanding of how God meant for his law, the, the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, Everything flows from it. How I meant for that to work. And the same misunderstanding sometimes happens in the New Testament. We breed commandments in the New Covenant too, which also flow from the Old Ten Commandments. We, we get it wrong often. We read what God commands and we misunderstand. There's a dynamic at work here, but it's not like a, a recipe as to how to make a good life. It's actually meant to, to point out to us something and lead us on beyond this law to something even better than the law, to lead us to the gospel. That's what we're going to consider this morning as we look into the middle of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Last week, in the beginning of this chapter, verses 1 to 6, we saw Paul raise and then compare and contrast two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. The old was external, written in letters on a stone tablet in the Ten Commandments, outside of us. But then the New Covenant, which was foreshadowed in the Old and even by all the prophets, is actually by the Spirit put inside of a person. It's, it's written inside of us on our hearts. It's verse 6 especially. And unlike the letter on the external tablets that brings death, the, the Spirit inside of us is how God gives life to his people. It brings us life. That's what we experience, we who live in the new covenant. That's what we are ministering to others as new covenant ministers. We do that for their joy, that they would come to experience what we've experienced. So we, we live in something, we receive something that's, that's internal, written on our hearts, and we're giving it away. And at that point right there, we come to verse 7, and that's where I'm going to pick up reading this morning. Thinking about these two covenants... I'm going to read 7 to 11, and then I'm going to draw two observations about a glory that is overwhelmed by a greater and surpassing glory. So that's where we're going this morning. We pick up in verse 7 of chapter 3. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which is being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, how much more will what is permanent have glory? Verses 7 to 11. So two observations. Here's the first. The old covenant was glorious and fading. 
for a reason. The old covenant was glorious and fading for a reason. There was purpose in that. In these five verses, Paul uses the word glory ten times. That's, that's the, the focused theme here. Glory, as a noun, is great honor or great distinction. Some high, exalted beauty or splendor or value. So then something that has glory is something that's worth being praised, it's worth being gloried in, sometimes we say. We might describe it as glorious. So what's going on through these verses here is Paul's talking about something having great honor and splendor, worth being praised and highly admired and regarded. Actually, he's talking about two somethings that are glorious. And all through the structure is comparing one to the other. Verse 7, if, which really means since, since the ministry of death, the one that was carved with letters on stone, this is coming right out of verse 6 where he talked about how the, the letter on stone brings death, it kills. So now this is a ministry or a covenant of death. And it came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of the glory. What's that about? This is from Exodus 34. You can look back at it or jot it down later and look at it later. But when God called Moses up onto Mount Sinai and then sent him back with the Ten Commandments in, in, in hand, and then when God met with Moses repeatedly in the tent of meeting before Moses would go out and teach the law to the people, after coming down and after coming out, people noticed Moses' face is shining. His face is like a gigantic flashlight. This light coming off of it, which was so odd, supernatural, and intimidating. The people were afraid of it because it was so odd. And it was, it was intimidating and it was bright just to look at. It was, was kind of hard. And so what Moses had to do was he would put a veil over his face so that people could stand to be around him. He'd take it off when he spoke and then he would put it back on covering up this shining glory. That's what he's referring to here. There was a lot of shining, bright glory associated with Moses with the ministry of the old covenant, the ministry of death. Or as he says in verse 9, there was glory in the ministry of condemnation. That's what's being made clear by Moses' shining face. A necessary sign. God had to do that because it is a bit counterintuitive. If you, if you think and you hear glory, great honor, great distinction, high, exalted beauty and splendor and value be upon the ministry of death and condemnation. That, that seems a little bit odd, doesn't it? Like those things don't quite fit but they do. God showed us. God made Moses' face shine to make that clear. So what's glorious about that law? Well, it's glorious because of what it shows us, what it reveals. God's commands and God's requirement, not just the Ten Commandments, but all that flows from it, reveals God to us and shows us his holy nature. Shows us who he is. Holds up in front of us what is, what is right and good about him and what is just and pure in him as he, as he stands against all that is evil and all that is sin and stands for what is good. And it reveals what is true and right and wise for humans, how we should live and how we should think and how we should speak so that we would prosper so we would thrive in this world that God has made. God is, in his commandments, in his law, he has given us insight into who he is. He has given us insight into what the world is. He has given us insight into how we are to be in this world before him. It is good and right and glorious. The condemnation comes in when we then deal with it. We read 
This is what I am. This is what I require. This is how I call you to walk. Do this and you will live with me. We read all of that that is good and right, and then we don't do it. We can't do it. We fail and are condemned by this good and right and holy God who opposes all that's wrong. Us. That's where the condemnation comes in. The, the law itself is good and right and glorious. It was filled with the glory. All that it presents and expresses is glorious. But it was a glory, end of the verse, which is being brought to an end. A phrase that's repeated in verse 11, the back end of this paragraph. He kind of has that in both, both the front and the back of the paragraph. Being brought to an end such that verse 10, that which had glory, it actually comes to have no glory by comparison at all. It's an interesting phrase there because being brought to an end, it kind of makes us think again about that shining face of Moses. And the grammar there actually points out being brought to an end from the beginning. You think of it like a, like a battery charge. As soon as you unplug your phone, the battery charge is going down. That's what he was saying. As soon as he gave the law, the glory of it was fading. It was being brought to an end from the start. And that's kind of implied in the story because presumably Moses' face did not shine like that. It doesn't seem like it shined like that for decades. You know, Moses was among them for 40 years and it doesn't seem like he had the veil shining for decades. What's going on there is God's creating a living lesson about covenants and glory. This old covenant, these commandments, this revelation of God and us and the way we should walk and God's requirements and his holiness, it's, it's all something good and right and glorious, which at the point it was, it was delivered, it was sunsetted right off the, right the get-go. It was really like, like an on-ramp onto something else that, that's supposed to go somewhere. It was, it was over from the start. Glorious, yeah, but fading on purpose. That's what he's expressing here in these verses. The first half of this glory comparison. So we read that, we understand it. There is indeed glory, it is good, and it is fading from the start. What are we supposed to do with that? Other than kind of nod. I mean, I'm saying things that I expect a number of us, we, we kind of know. What are you supposed to do with that other than say, okay, What's the next point? Well, what's Paul doing with it? It's one way you can study your Bible, kind of getting into it, thinking like, well, what, what's, why is it here? What's going on with it? Why did Paul bring this up? Well, he's confronting and trying to correct something, a problem there that we actually have here, too. A little different context, but it's the same basic problem. In Paul's context there in this moment in Corinth, something appears to us. Now, Paul never, in all of Paul's writing, he's often dealing with people who are opponents of his, and he never actually writes out, this is what the bad guys teach. We always have to kind of discern it from looking into a mirror. What does Paul emphasize? What does he critique? That's probably because somebody's offering that up as an alternative. So here, when we do that, what we, what we realize is Paul brings this up because the false teachers who have come to Corinth and are peeling parts of the church away from him, the people that he just called peddlers of God's word, right up above, the end of the previous chapter, peddlers of God's word, they're taking the scriptures. They're taking the old covenant and they're offering it to people. They're presenting it and saying, this is glorious. Moses' face, remember guys? Moses' face was blazing. This is glorious. Here, do this and you will live. They're presenting what is good and right in a completely wrong and destructive way. And Paul's confronting that so as to correct it. They're presenting it in a way that... that ironically, always appeals to human beings, back then and even today, here. A way of explaining these commandments that kind of lay it in front of us as if it's something good and right that we're called to do, that we can do, 
and that when we do, we will be pleasing to God. By my effort and by my work, I become worthy and righteous. That's what they were being taught. That's what some of them believed. And that's a common belief today. That's a common belief today among many religions of the world, among many religious people. It's a common belief in the religious culture right around us. Sometimes even within the church itself. There's a mistake in that. It says, God wants me to learn very carefully what he commands. To, to analyze it, to be very conscientious. And then to apply myself to it. To try hard. To become disciplined and careful, and to use community encouragement around me and, and the support of others and structures so that I submit to and that I obey God and I, I do what he has told us to do, and then that pleases him. And, and I've heard some religious people right there will tack on some, and then God's grace will help us with the rest when we don't do everything, but we do what we could do. And then after that, God helps us out. That's a common, a common teaching. Based on first, but I must do what I can do. That's why he told us, after all, right? This glorious set of commandments. That's common. If you want to put a title on that, what it's called is works righteousness. Works-based righteousness. It's common among many religions, common thinking about how one becomes pleasing to God. And maybe even check yourself on this. As I say that, I know that a lot of us here would say, that's not me. I, I, I know I'm righteous because of Christ. I understand that. Good. Here's where else this shows up sometimes in the church. You know you're not getting into heaven because of what you've done. But are you pleasing today because of what you've done? Are you pleasing today when your kids turn out right because you did the right thing in raising them? You did it the right way. Will your business prosper? Will God bless you because you did the right thing? You followed all of his commandments. You, you followed the path that he laid out. Do you believe that and do you follow all the, all the commandments? Do you read the laws and say, what, I, I'm going to read a book about parenting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go look for him teaching on marriage so that I can make it work out right. And if I follow and hold my mouth just right and stand like this, then it will. And then are you frustrated when it doesn't? Because it was supposed to be A plus B equals C and I got L. What happened? What? That's in the church. A kind of a latent works righteousness. Not a works righteousness to get us into heaven, but the belief that if I follow this just right, and it's good, it's God's word, it's the Bible, it's glorious. If I follow it just right, then things will work out right. That's also works righteousness, guys. That's common for us. It's oddly an encouraging and comforting thought because it tells you in a, in a tricky way, it tells you it's kind of in your hands. Think, just take one example. And how comforting is that for your average parent? Flip it around. How uncomfortable is it to hear my kids' lives, futures, hearts, approach to everything they're thinking is not in my hands. I can't do anything about that. That's not very comforting. We actually want, as parents, we actually want to hear, here's what you do. We want to hear, raise them up right in the way they should go and they will not turn from it. Thank goodness. And we take that as a law. It's not a law. It's wisdom. 
tells us some general truths, but it's not actually in our hands. None of it's in our hands. It's, it's strangely, though, oddly comforting to think it's actually in my hands. And it produces some rest in our own efforts and some pride when we think we've accomplished it. And some judgmentalism when we look at so-and-so who didn't. If they'd only done what I did, then their kids would be like my kids. Then their business would prosper like mine. Then their lives would be all ordered like mine is. It can produce some pride and some judgmentalism. <laughs> or if you're this one, a crushing burden of failure because you never get it right. And that's why it's not working out, is I never get it right. I'm such a loser. And insecurity, because if you did get it right today, well, you better get it right next month too, and next year too. This is life under works righteous. This is life under the law. It produces pride, produces arrogance and judgmentalism. It produces great burden and fear and insecurity. It's life under the law, because it's all using God's glorious law completely incorrectly. Indeed, it's given to us and it's right and it's good and it holds up God and holds up the way that we should walk. But then it also tells us when it says do this and you will live, it says do this, all of this, not a good solid 75% of it, all of it and you will live. And if you don't, you're lawbreakers. It's given to us fading on purpose so that it holds up something and says, but you can't and you don't. This is actually not supposed to be the, it's supposed to point you somewhere else. This is going somewhere to something that is of surpassing glory, which we're going to come to in a moment. But what we need to do with this part of this passage right now is say, I want nothing to do with works righteousness. I want nothing to do with that. I don't want that in my own life. I don't want to commend that to others because all that leads to is a laundry list of negative stuff and condemnation and death. I want nothing to do with that. So I would, I would invite you, church, I would invite you to think about works righteousness and not just on the official level of no, I don't think I'm getting into heaven by my works. But to think of it on the next level down, but do I think I'm ordering my life by my works? That I'm making a right life by what I do? That's dependence on self, and what self does, that's works, righteousness. Set that aside. Recognize that the law was given, that it's good and right and glorious, and it's fading on purpose to lead us onto something else which surpasses it. Which brings us to the next point. The second observation. The new covenant is supremely glorious forever and for us. The new covenant, not like the old, is supremely glorious, not just glorious, and it's forever, not fading, and it's for us. Contrasting covenant minister not by Moses, but by, by Paul and those who are new covenant ministers with him, like we saw in verse 6, is the covenant of the Spirit written on our hearts. And if the ministry of death, as he says, was glorious, would not the ministry of the Spirit have more glory? Of course it will. This is logic here. Because if the ministry of condemnation was glorious... If the whole system of revealing God and God's law and God's character and what we're called to walk and upholding God's justice as he judges and condemns sin, if, if that's all glorious, then of course the solution to that problem would be even more glorious. That's his point in verse 9. The new far exceeds it in glory, it says. Well, verse 10, it surpasses it in glory, such that by comparison, the old has no glory, so to speak. It's gone. Like the flashlight that, that was shining off of Moses' face, it, it's, it looks bright in a dark room until somebody turns on a flood bank it, and it just drowns it all. You can't even see the flashlight beam anymore. It, by comparison, makes it no glory whatsoever. It overwhelms it, it drowns it out because this one, verse 10, is not passing away permanent. 
this covenant, what it accomplishes, the solution, is complete and sufficient and surpassingly glorious. It remains forever because it solves the big problem of humankind. Look back at verse 9. So we're going to focus on verse 9. This ministry does not bring condemnation, but instead it is the ministry of righteousness that by far exceeds and marginalizes anything else that was good and glorious. It lasts forever because this ministry is how God brings righteousness to people. How God brings it. Not how we work and create it. How God brings it. He gives life, as he said at the end of verse 6. Sit and soak in this for a minute or two or five. A life. This is the supremacy of the glory of God. Here in a phrase, the ministry of righteousness. This is what is most supremely glorious. What is most exceedingly full of honor and great distinction. What is majestic in splendor and beauty and value, what is most brilliant, most praiseworthy. This work of God, this ministry of righteousness by which God draws near to grab a hold of people who are sinners and condemned and bring them to life rightly and justly. To make them to stand in front of the holy God of the old covenant, the, the holy God of Mount Sinai, quaking and burning. To stand in front of that God and hear from his mouth, to see off of his blazing face, righteous. You are in the right. You are are forgiven, clean, pure, blessedly acceptable. That, that's a miracle, and it is. While we were still sinners, condemned under the old covenant law, at that time God sent God the Son to the earth to take on flesh and dwell among us, not just to teach us how to be better at keeping the law, but to teach us what the law actually was and what it actually required, to speak it and then to show it in his perfect, sinless life. The only one who ever kept the law all the way through, he showed us what that looks like and then, amazingly, went to the cross to die under the condemnation of the law that did not belong to him. It belonged to us. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. God made him who was perfect. He made him to be as if he had sinned. He didn't. For us. And then an amazing, astonishing grace, he then made us as if we were righteous, we aren't, but he made us to stand righteous before him. He credited onto our account, he wrote onto us an alien righteousness, that of God the Son, written onto us, counted in our stead. That's the core blessing of the new covenant. United in Christ by faith, not by works, by faith. I trust what God did in Christ on the cross to pay for my sin and make me righteous. I do not trust in what I do to make me righteous. I trust in him. That's at the core of the new covenant. And that's how we human beings, sinners though we are, are made righteous by God himself. Given life, not the death we deserved, by grace, through faith, 
not by works. That's you, Christian. And I am primarily talking to Christians. But if you're not a Christian, if you're hearing this and you're, and you're, you're thinking about where do, I, where do I fall in this, what, what do I make of this all, I want to be completely clear. I'm talking to Christians about what is them, and I'm talking to you also about what could be you. This, this, is, the, this is the offer of this ministry of righteousness. There, there's, a, there's a serving up of something. That's what ministering means. A serving up, an offering of something. Here's how you become righteous. Not by taking this law, trying very hard to do it and make yourself acceptable, but by what Christ did and his payment for your sin. Trusting him himself, that's how you become righteous. That's the offer. That's glorious. That could be yours. Christian, it is you. You are righteous not by your works, but by faith. And you really can't mess that up, Christian. You stand righteous. You stand before God with no condemnation on you. You have to put that right up next to all your sin and all your shame and all your failure and say, I believe that and shockingly, That is release. That is relief. That is life. That is delight. That is joy in Jesus. That's you. And that's not all. Glorious though that is, can there possibly be anything better than that? Well, not better, but more. His Spirit, who worked in us to open our eyes, The only reason you understand any of that is that the Spirit of God worked in you to open your eyes so that you would see it, the glory in this offer of Christ crucified. That Spirit, remember from last week, that Spirit now comes to live inside of us and takes a spiritual pencil and writes on your heart. Writes on your heart. Does not take the stone and tape it to your chest and tell you to carry it writes on your heart to make you a different person, the law of God. The difference being, it doesn't just say, this, this, this law and the Spirit doesn't take the law and say, you should love like Christ, and you should love like God commands you. Love your neighbor. He actually writes on your heart to make you more loving so that you love like him and like he requires. He doesn't just tell you, you should rejoice and not grumble, but he actually writes on your heart so that you are more joyful and less inclined to grumbling because you see what's good and glorious and right. You see what's lovely. You see it. That's the work of the Spirit inside of you that's changing you, to renovate you, to renew you, to grow you up. That's also you, Christian which is great news because we are still well-messed up people. Thoroughly well-messed up people. You are. If you think for a second time around the loop, loop, especially having set aside all kinds of, of facade works righteousness, we are thoroughly messed up people. Still. And when we consider, oh, I I stand righteous, accepted before God, good. But also the Spirit of God lives inside of me to make me increasingly walk in righteousness. We often call that sanctification to clarify. He's going to make me more like Jesus. I'm thoroughly messed up, but I'm not hopeless. You're not hopeless. You are thoroughly messed up, but you're not hopeless. Because God the Spirit works inside of you to cause you to walk increasingly in righteousness. That's you too. And that's not all. There's more. Because glorious as all that is, there's the covenant here that we experience and that we minister to others and call them to hope in is not only just about Christ our righteousness and Christ our sanctification. It is also how he is our sure redemption. We stand righteous. We are being made to walk in increasingly righteous ways. And one day we will be removed from here and placed in a place that is completely right. 
and we will be home when that happens. We will no longer struggle with even the presence of sin, and we will bask forever in the glory of God's sovereign grace to us. You are made righteous in standing. You are made increasingly righteous in walking, and you will be made to dwell in a place of total righteousness experienced in every aspect, sinless and perfect in a sinless and perfect world again. That's you too, Christian. All of that in Christ. All of that in the new covenant. That is, that is glory upon surpassing and never-ending glory. But here's the trick. That only seems glorious when the old covenant has sunk in and gripped you. If you're sitting here right now thinking, that's pretty decent, that's, that's good, knew a lot of that, what's for lunch? Has the old covenant sunk in and gripped you and does it still when it has broken you under its condemnation and killed you under its holy penalty then this all seems glorious I ask you about that because the truth is most people aren't there I've only been there once, maybe a long time ago, and aren't there right now. Most people, certainly out there in the world, and a lot of us even, we try and we manage often to avoid to kind of slip out from under the true weight of the old covenant in its ministry. We look at it just long enough to understand the direction it's pointing, we get, we get the general idea, and then we stop thinking about it and stop looking, convincing ourselves I'm not that bad. I'm pretty okay, I think. I mean, I need to shave a little bit, yeah. But then I'll be okay. And so people discard the law or lighten the law such that it seems reasonable and doable and maybe even done. I remember first time I began to actually think seriously about spiritual things, I was in college and I actually became a Christian then. And I remember feeling this great sense of relief the first time that I actually came to feel like I don't break any of the Ten Commandments anymore. Nice. Because I knew I had problems with all of them, and I knew that that's where they were, and I was looking at that and thinking, but you know, now I, I've really, I, I don't steal anymore, not even copyrighted music. And the telling of little white lies, which is lying, don't do that anymore. Keeping my hands off other women. Good there. Finally, I don't break the Ten Commandments anymore. This is good. And then someone ruined my day. And thereby introduced me to true surpassing glory. You've got to follow this through. They popped my bubble By relating to me the teaching of Jesus, if you lust after another in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. And you murder in your mind when you slander and hate. You're deserving of the fires of hell for that. Pop my bubble. I realized I am condemned and I'm killed as Jesus ministered, as Jesus ministered condemnation and death to me. Because that's me. An adulterous murderer. A thief and a liar. And that's you. All of us. We are well and truly messed up. And it, are you aware of that? And are you honest about that? Not about sin in general. Everybody here is going to agree. So with some vague notion of, yeah, I, I am a sinner. Does the glory of God 
pierce you. The demanding law blaze at you such that you tremble in fear before him who said, be holy as I am holy. And you know you're not, not by a long shot, in specific and grievous and embarrassing and damage and damning ways. The generic never hurt anybody's feelings. I'm talking about specifics. The glory of the old covenant is seen if and as it generates this sort of miraculous response in the human heart that we don't dodge it or blunt it or, or think of it as small and doable, but that we see it and are broken or pierced or crushed by it. And we, we assess ourselves honestly, specifically, and see ourselves in our own situation as hopeless. Scrolling through Instagram and TikTok hoping to accidentally find something illicit and sexual. Hoping to. That's you. I don't do that. Because I don't have Instagram and TikTok. I do that in other ways. How do you do it? Skimming Facebook so as to be critical and proud anonymously. That's you. Not me, I don't have Facebook. I do that in other ways. Lazy at work, idolizing sports and cars and brand new kitchens. All of which is the deliberate direction of our hearts and all of which flies in the face of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all yourself, and your neighbors like your own self too. All of which, you've got to hear me with this, all of which should pop your bubble and prime you. It's not meant to pierce you and pop your bubble so as to leave you like... It's meant to pop your bubble and prime you for Glory. To see something truly glorious. The ground of the new covenant in Christ where the spirit of the living God chases down condemned, dead in sin sinners like you to pour out over them sovereign, saving, glorious grace to make you to stand righteous before him, to make you from the inside out walk increasingly in righteousness and to deliver you to a place of total, complete righteousness all by glorious grace is love and it's mercy for you who don't deserve it. That's the glory of this covenant of righteousness. You're meant to be primed to see that by being pierced by the law first. Do you throw yourself on the law regularly? Not to draw your own blood in the end, but to draw his and to see it covering you for sweet love. This is how we have to deal with the law. Sometimes we are too weak and we set it aside and we say, that, that's all negative. That's about condemnation and death. Go away. Don't talk to me about that. No, please do talk to me about that. Talk to me clearly and strongly and loudly and then tell me of the cross. There's life. There's life. It appears glorious. Truly as it is when you see what it's the solution to, and you deeply believe that this is solved. Brothers and sisters, please, for your own joy, be real and be serious and be aware of the law. Not for the sake of works righteousness, but for the sake of setting you up, for leading you like an on-ramp onto the glory of this new covenant. For the joy of your own soul, for vibrancy in your life. You are his righteous. And that's good news. But the last thing we should note, this is for us. But the whole thing is set up in this paragraph. He, of course, is talking about the covenant that Moses ministered 
and the covenant that he ministers. But he uses the words ministry often to point out something. It's something that's being given away to others. And his point that he's trying to make here against, against his enemies in Corinth is that you guys are, are like repeating the ministry of Moses. Moses didn't have anything. By comparison, Moses didn't have anything. We have the goods. I do, says Paul, the new covenant minister. And, and all of us who are with him as new covenant ministers, we have the goods, and not just for ourselves, we have the goods to minister to others. What we are offering to others is not just a body of requirements taped onto the outside that they have to carry. But what we're offering is righteousness. To be forgiven by and befriended by this God and to be changed and fixed on the inside and to be brought to a place of glorious purity. That's what we're offering to people. That's what we're ministering to them, this new covenant. Perhaps a change in our perspective would make it seem like like sweet work rather than burdensome work. We're we're like walking up to people and trying to convince them to take a $100 bill. No, for free, no strings attached. Take a $100 bill, here. They may not take it. That's okay. We don't have to coerce it and like hide it in a sandwich or something or stick it into their pockets. We Just be open about it. It's a $100 bill. Here. We don't control the taking, but we do control the giving, the offering. And sometimes we don't realize, I, I'm actually a minister of a glorious covenant that brings life to people. There's something sweet in that, that, that if we realize that will, will lead us to think about it and prepare differently for situations where we might be able to minister this, where we might be walking into a room to be the aroma of Christ. Sometime recently, I'm going to be vague with the details here because I'm staying in front of everybody on the internet. Sometime recently, I knew I was going to be around a group of people that I'm regularly around who I know are not believers in Jesus. And so... I thought, I want to be the aroma of Christ to these people at this point. So I prayed about that. Lord, I don't know what's going to happen, but will you in somehow, in some way, make me to speak of, provide an opportunity, open a door, that there will be some opportunity to speak of, or situations in which I might live like this one who brings life. I want to, I want to show that or I want to speak of that. Will you please create an opportunity for that? And then I, I went to be around these folks. And I'm not there but like two minutes. And a conversation starts with one of them that was unusual, that was a little different. It, it started on the, the coronavirus path and, and this person was expressing some things that were a little more personal, a little more about that person's family and some different experiences, and I thought, ooh, this is different. And I was extremely conscious that I had prayed, not like an hour before about this time, and this conversation, and, and you know what happened? Nothing. The conversation immediately changed and went somewhere else. We never got back to it, and the rest of the night, to all of my knowledge, nothing unusual happened. I suppose I was the living aroma of Christ, but there weren't any more conversations, nothing more explicit. The end. Then I went home. That was a tremendously successful witnessing night. Not because 10 people came to Christ, but because a Christian thought about the glory of the covenant of righteousness, thought about, in this case, his spot as an aroma spreader, led there by the Lord, prayed, and paid attention. 
The results aren't up to us. The results are not up to us. And that stands out in my mind, lest you think I'm too male and horn here. That stands out in my mind because I'm around those folks often and I differently thought about and differently prayed about that evening. Lots of times I don't. Unsuccessful witnessing opportunity. Because I walked in there not thinking about it at all, not praying about it at all, not looking to be Jesus among these people. I just walked in present. God may use that, of course. But that's not what I'm proud of because I wasn't there. What I want to encourage us all to do is, is to think, this is the ministry of the new covenant righteousness for me and for others. My job as a minister of the new covenant is to prayerfully recognize I'm the aroma of Christ wherever he leads me. I'm going to step into the room smelling like him. I want to smell like you. I want to speak like you. Lord, open doors. I'll leave the results to you. That's successful witnessing. Results be what they may. And that's fun. Is that bizarre to say that? That's actually fun. Because I'm there, you'd be there, loving people. Not working them. Not working, we're loving people. And loving Jesus. And living amongst them for his glory and for their good. That's good and right and fun. Pleasing to him. That's what we're called to as ministers of the new covenant. Something that is awesome for us and for others too. So may he make us more like that, a people who experience it and a people who then want to give it away because we actually believe it is glorious. This glory that surpasses everything else on earth is ours and ours for others. Let me pray. Lord, help us, please, as your people.